Okay, so we have discussed how to name compounds. We can write some formulas for them. Um, and so now what would be useful is um, to be able to quantify the mass of that compound. We have a couple different um, things under our tool belt, but what we really want to discuss now is the idea of formula mass, also called a molar mass. and the mole. We briefly discussed what the mole is. Um, we're gonna investigate it a little bit more now as it relates to the molecules and the compounds that we just have built up in this chapter. So just as we've had um, a formula unit, which is the smallest whole number ratio of ions. That would be in a, an ionic bond. Um, we can have a formula mass, which is going to be looked at as the average mass of a molecule based off of its formula. Why is this important? Well, when we're talking about something like sodium chloride, we know that sodium chloride is a ratio of sodium plus one and chlorine minus one built up in the lattice structure um, of sodium chloride ionic compound. When we look at utilizing this in the lab, we don't have sodium element or chlorine element anymore. We have the ions and they are collectively together in the ionic compound sodium chloride. So when we're looking at utilizing um, our samples in the lab, the mole, remember, brought together the subatomic realm to the laboratory realm. And since we don't just look at elements, we also need to utilize that mole in compounds. So the formula mass of something like NaCl is going to be the sum of its elements. Particularly, there's one sodium, which is 22.990 grams per mole on the periodic table, plus one chlorine, which is 35.45 grams per mole. So they're additive. Together, they're 58.44 grams per mole sodium chloride. Why is that helpful? because now we can go through the mole to get to how many atoms or how many ions. For example, a sample of NaCl has a mass of 17.2 grams. How many molecules or we can say formula units of NaCl are there in the sample? Just like we used before, mass can be converted to moles. 
Now, what we are going to use to convert to moles is our molar mass, our summed up, our additive formula mass. And then we can use Avogadro's number just like before. Notice how we uh, can now change Avogadro's number to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of NaCl per one mole of NaCl. So again, making sure that grams cancels with grams, moles cancels with moles, we're left with formula units of NaCl. We can punch those into our calculator. And what we really wanna make sure, again, is we revisit the idea of significant figures. Again, a molar mass, a formula mass, just like a unit conversion, will always be infinite number of sig figs. So here, and our measured value will be our three sig figs. 1.77 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of NaCl. That's going to be very important for us for either an ionic compound or a molecular compound. Um, they're all gonna be calculated the same way. Uh, but we can now interconvert between sodium chloride mass and all the way to sodium chloride formula units. Let's just see one more. If a sample of CO2 contains six point one one times ten to the twenty four molecules of CO two. What is the mass of the sample? So again, in order to go from molecules to mass, we will need to be able to calculate a formula mass or a molecular mass for something like carbon dioxide. Just because it's a covalent compound does not mean it's any different than our molecular compound or our ionic compound that we just did. So looking at CO2, one carbon is 12. 0.01 grams per mole. O2 would be 2 times 15.999 grams per mole. Add those up and you're getting around 44.01 grams per mole for the molar mass of carbon dioxide. Now, when we set that up, the measured value that we are starting with is in molecules. So we would multiply it by one mole of CO2 over 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, and then multiply it by that molar mass. Making sure everything still cancels out, molecules with molecules, Moles with moles, we're left with grams of CO2, 4.47 times 10 to the 2 grams of CO2. You could also put that in non-scientific notation, 447 grams. Either one is appropriate. Three sig figs, though, because of our given measured value. So when we're looking at these calculations, now that we have built up our molecules and our compounds, we can do the same mole type calculations that we had done before. Okay. Now, 
when we are looking at uh, the composition of compounds, um, a chemical formula indicates the relative quantities of each element in that compound. And that's extremely useful information. Um, scientists have tried to investigate um, unknown compounds and found out, uh, tried to find what their composition is, tried to find what their um, formulas were. So I want us to think way back, um, you know, even just 35 years ago, there was um, a ton of research with uh, ozone and the destruction of the ozone layer in our atmosphere. Um, and one of the main components was um, a CFC, a chl chlorofluorocarbon. And they're not, the scientists even back 35 years ago did not know what those compounds look like or what their composition were. And so what we're gonna talk about now is um, how scientists actually discover the composition of compounds, how are molecular formulas discovered. Um, the scientist who worked on chlorofluorocarbons um, actually received the Nobel Prize um, for their discovery of uh, the structures of CFCs um, that were making that hole in the ozone layer. Um, a couple of them actually worked at um, the University of California, Irvine, not too far, far away um, for some time as well. For our composition of compounds, one of the main ways to develop um, the idea of composition is a mass percent. And a mass percent is going to be calculated using the mass of an element divided by the total mass of the compound times 100%. So say for instance, we wanted to take a typical, very small CFC, carbon with two chlorines and two fluorines and calculate the mass percent of chlorine, which is a big, catalyst for the destruction of the ozone layer. Um, so its percentage is one of the most important ones to figure out. We would say, okay, there are two chlorine elements. So there's that mass divided by the total. Again, the molar mass or the formula mass, which I usually abbreviate MM, would be one carbon, two chlorines, and two fluorines. And what we could calculate with that is 120.91 grams per mole. I'm not gonna do units for this because the mass divided by mass would cancel out. So as long as your mass of the element is in grams per mole and your total mass is in grams per mole, you are good to go. 58.64%. Now again, uh, sig figs are usually important, but they're not that important for this one since the periodic table that you're given has the masses um, of each element. Try to try to utilize that periodic table as best as you can, um, but no sig figs for this one simply because they are variable based off of the periodic table that you're using. Now, what we could do with that mass percent is um, actually figure out a quick way of converting between grams of a compound to grams of an element, such as this. In 1.00 kilograms of CCl2F2, how many grams? of chlorine are there. Now you could take this and go from kilograms to grams of CCl2F2 and then change it into moles and then figure out a mole ratio and then go to grams again. But because we have this mass percentage, we already have a conversion factor that says there are 58.64 grams of chlorine 
for every 100, remember it's a percentage, grams of CCl2, F2. So mass percentage is actually a very useful way of being able to quickly convert from grams of one component to grams total or grams of another component in a given sample without really going through the mole. You are going through the mole, but you are doing it in a very um, underestimated way because you already have the mass percent. So when we're looking at this, uh, conversion factors that you should know are is this 100 or 1,000 grams to one kilogram, and that was in grams of whole compound, and now we'll just get grams of chlorine. I like doing things in scientific notation, but again, you don't have to. either way, but three sigmoids. What we note there is this idea that for every one compound, there are two moles of chlorine. There are two chlorine atoms in one CCl2F2 molecule. So what we could say is there are two moles of chlorine for every one mole of molecule. Very powerful tool. Okay. Now in determining a chemical formula, that's if we have the chemical formula, we can utilize it. If we don't have the chemical formula, say we have component data like this, a sample of a nitrogen and oxygen compound has 24.5 grams of nitrogen and 70 grams, I'll say 70.0 for sig figs. We won't need the sig figs, but of oxygen, what is the empirical formula? Well, we have to remember is that our definition of the empirical formula. An empirical formula is going to be that smallest whole number ratio of atoms. Why it's important to be able to say empirical formula here is we can determine a molecular formula, but we're gonna need a little bit more information. Um, so let's look at this problem first and um, identify a couple of things. Now, um, we are given the individual masses. So we could calculate the moles. Remember, the moles are what bridges between our atoms and our mass. And so when we look at that smallest whole number ratio of atoms in the empirical formula, what we're really asking for is the smallest whole number ratio of moles. And so we can calculate the moles and then find that smallest whole number ratio. So let's take 24.5 grams of nitrogen. Again, that is just a periodic table, elemental nitrogen, not uh, a molecule. So we are looking at using our mol molar masses or our 
atomic masses here. For nitrogen, we look on the periodic table and that is 14.007 grams. So when we do that math again, at the end of the day, we are going to be getting a um, whole number ratio. So sig figs don't really matter. Don't round too early. Yeah, I know there should be only three sig figs. I'll put a little note under there, but I'll, I'll carry out those um, sig figs a little bit so I don't have any rounding errors. Same thing for oxygen, 15.999 grams of oxygen. So when I'm doing this, what I have in mind is the idea that all of my formulas are going to be based off of the moles. Again, this is moles of nitrogen, moles of oxygen. Now those don't look like whole numbers and we don't want to round here either. We don't want to say 1.7 is 2 and 4.3 is 4. That's not what it is. So to find the smallest whole number ratio, what we actually want to do is imagine that these are subscripts. 4.375 under oxygen. I'll make nitrogens a little smaller. 1.74. Four, nine. And we're going to divide by the smallest. By dividing by the smallest, what we can start to do is get that smallest whole number ratio. What we see with that is the nitrogen, oops, that's a 1, and an oxygen that's a 2.5. Now we're closer. Again, we can't round, but we can say that a 1 to 2.5 ratio is really a 2 to 5 ratio. Multiply that by 2. 2.5 is really 2 and 1 half. To get rid of that half, I would multiply it by 2. But what I do to one side, I have to do to the other. So my empirical formula, N2O5.